So I'm here to talk about turning threats into opportunities. I'm going to give uh, one company's perspective, the Washington Post perspective, and some things that we did, some approaches we took, and some of the results we've had. And hopefully, this will be um, uniformly applicable to a lot of other, uh, other businesses. So the, the, key, the reason I talk, the name of this talk is Turning Threats into Opportunities is that there, is a lot, there are a lot of things facing content providers that are threats. There are ma three major trends I'm going to talk about very briefly are the migration to mobile, the rise of big data, and the growth of the power of platforms. And these are things, particularly the last one, that to be clear to everybody who's a publisher, a content producer, or if you're involved in the ecosystem of publishing, there are aspects of these changes that are threatening to the business. That is clear. But what's happened is that there, are, there has been sort of an overwrought sense that this is going to cause the death of all publishing and all quality content. And we believe that's not true. So what we want to look for and what the Post has tried to look for is how do you leverage these trends to your advantage? Because trying to slow down megatrends is not usually a good idea. It's actually generally not possible. Uh, the analogy I'd use is aging. If you, if you want to say, you know, I'd rather not get old, that's probably not really going to happen. So instead, you may say, what are the advantages of getting old? Maybe I get more wise, I get more experience. So how do you leverage this, the, what you have going for you? So that's what we try to do. So if you look at the sort of gloom and doom that surrounds content and, and quality content in general, here are some quotes. A continued march towards the reversal of 20 years of accessibility. And then two quotes in particular about a Facebook offering, a Facebook platform. One is essentially saying that the thing that makes newspapers feel the worst about the industry is that they would be forced to even consider signing a lopsided deal like what Facebook offers. To become part of the Facebook platform, they're saying, is such a bad deal, publishers shouldn't consider it. At the same time, another uh, news source says, Facebook's generous terms are a lure to entice you into dependency. So one group says, it's so bad, how could publishers consider it? The other group says, it's so good, it's actually a trick. But what they both agree with is that it's bad. So Facebook equals bad. Uh, another sentence of quotes, all publishers in this gradual relinquishing of their brand and audience ought to have an existential crisis. So with the rise of platforms, there's no room for individual brands. The question of being asked whether individual news sites are on their way out, particularly on mobile, so it may cease to exist. And to round out this sort of gloom and doom uh, scenario, Publishers have websites you just spend less than 20 minutes on, apps no one wants to pay for, paywalls whose growth is flattening. What does the future hold for them? So pretty grim, right? So this is a generally grim sense. We don't have that sense at the Post. What we have to look for is where do you place your bets? There are big trends that are going to cause problems, but you have to do something about it. And I'll talk about what we've done and what has happened as a result. The concept that we have is you have to identify those key trends. Where is the puck going, to use Wayne Gretzky's famous line? And then how do you leverage that, how do you take advantage of it? Then experiment and measure and analyze your results and rinse and repeat as quickly as you can. But the question is you have to make bets on big trends. You have to leverage the big trends, not avoid them. So what are those big trends? The explosive growth of mobile. In each case, these trends have a threat, but they have some silver lining. The, the problem with mobile is people say you're trading digital, you know, print pennies, digital dimes, mobile, pen, uh, mobile pennies. But the, the, the opportunity is young people are going there. It's where the audience is going to be. Big data. What's the threat to big data? The threat is that people can, instead of buying publishers, they can buy audiences. And you can decide, I want to buy an audience with a certain composition and avoid brands entirely. But the opportunity there is you can leverage your customer experience and create better customer experience with predictive analytics, things like that. Platform growth, the problem is people may be on platforms and decide to be on Facebook and Apple and Google and not come to publishers anymore. What's the opportunity? You can create discovery for your brand. So I talk about specific experiments that we've done, we're trying to leverage these, and some, a point of view we have. So in order to do any experiments, you have to think, well, what is your competitive advantage? What differentiates you? The Post, and when Jeff Bezos bought the company, he believed this, and it's very, very important. Journalism still matters, because although lots of people will go to Apple News and go to all sorts of news sites and see their news on Facebook Instant, 
they don't get a sense necessarily of what is true. You can get a sense of what's being read, but what's true? That matters. What's the hierarchy of news? What's the relative of importance of different events? Not everyone cares about it, but there's a substantial audience that does care about it, and our competitive advantage is journalism. On the other axis, the people who are having the most success are engineering companies. All the platform companies are having success because they know about making the user experience better, using predictive analytics. How do you reduce latency? How do you design to optimize for different devices? So our philosophy is with Jeff, Jeff Bezos' ownership and a 138-year history of journalism, we could potentially be one of the only brands in the upper right-hand corner. So we could potentially that's our, our goal. So it starts with a point of view about the consumer experience. What are we trying to do? Digital browsing isn't easy. There's a problem with digital browsing, but it could be easy. And one of the things that we talked about a lot was the newspaper actually brings a lot of things. It's, it's hundreds of years of consumer experience about very bright, vivid images and an easily digestible text that lends, you, lends it to, uh, you know, to, to quick summary information. You get a lot of information in a hurry. And digital devices aren't like that, a lot of small links. So we've created experiences that actually mimic the user experience that's been honed over hundreds of years in print. So we've created offerings particularly optimized for mobile where you can slide. They're very visual, very highly designed. And you can get a sense of the hierarchy of news. You can pinch it on the screen to look and be able to sort and, and start, try to see what do I want to read in that sort of discovery mode, that serendipity mode. And then you tap it to get a read view, which is a very big magazine-like experience which is a different kind of experience. So we've optimized it for mobile particularly because it's a mobile first world. And so you have to be able to do this. And it's very highly designed and very easily scrolled, zero latency. This is the kind of stuff you need to have in mobile. We've even developed it for the watch. Try to make it, it's got to work on all devices. And then creating discovery is the biggest problem any brand has. Because there are so many pieces of content out there. How do you create a discovery? Here is where the growth of the platforms is a huge advantage to us. So what we've done that's different from what a lot of publishers have done is we've fully embraced that. We've said, Apple, Facebook, everybody, you get 100% of our content because they're great user experiences, they're fast, they're, they're low latency, they have a huge built-in audience, and you can't replicate the experience of the Washington Post and if you are going to be satisfied with that experience, you'll be satisfied with that experience whether the post is in there or not. So it's going to be successful. Our participation or lack thereof will not determine whether Apple succeeds. But we can introduce an audience to people who say, hey, that content was pretty interesting. Let me go check it out on WashingtonPost.com. So as a result, we have a Kindle Fire partnership. We've created on every Kindle device, it now comes preloaded with the Washington Post. And we have an icon that changes every day. It says, here's the Oscars. Here's something NFL preview, an Ebola story. And the icon changes and comes to the front of the carousel. We have a, a deal with Prime. We have automatic free access with Prime. Apple News, we're fully involved in, and uh, partnered with them. Facebook Instant Articles, we're, we're partnered. People talk about brand, how you lose your brand identity. But a piece of content is a branded, that's a piece of your brand. It's got the, it, we, you know, no one can touch our, our content or rewrite our content. So we're putting it forward in a way that we think introduces people to our content, allows discovery, allows monetization in the short term, but it's really a brand vehicle. Uh, Twitter moments, very interesting what Twitter's trying to do and getting much more interactive, much more visual, allowing a different kind of storytelling. It's great for video, for text, and for photo, so we're very much deep involved with them. And Google AMP, trying to make the mobile browsing experience on MWeb much faster, much better, and we think anything that's, it, that acts in service of a better user experience, we want to be behind. So we're also very involved with this. Another thing that's sort of interesting is so what's old is new again, that one of the great marketing vehicles is the oldest one in the world, email. right? Because everybody, your email inbox is still a huge source of your, sort of your window into the world. So we have visual newsletters that now come in that are particularly optimized for mobile and scrolling, and so we find great open rates and great experience through visual emails, and we're delivering those through all of the platforms as well. So taking big data, again, there's a threat of big data is that personalization, you can say that everybody can just bypass all news and, and, and you know, create their own news from, from individual feeds. 
The issue is most consumers don't want to do that kind of work. So we try to do the work for them. So we have Amazon-inspired targeting. So from a consumer's perspective, if you read the Washington Post, your experience will be different. Now, we're going to curate it. We're going to create the hierarchy of news for you. We're going to create the, basic, the same basic package. We're also going to customize it. We have created a software called Clavis. It's part of a whole comprehensive uh, suite of products that we've built ourselves. And what we do, we analyze everything we publish. So we take the consumer and their reading habits, their demographics, their recent activity, create a, a series of things that say, here are the clusters of things the person likes to read. And we personalize the experience. We say, OK, here's what you like to read. You're a lot of your health, interested in health. We're going to serve you this kind of thing. Even on the home page, we're going to have the home page technology, but also have a post recommends. The article is going to say, these are the kind of things, based on your experience, we think you're likely to read. And we have, there are certain signals. We have a, a predictive analytics team led by PhDs trying to figure out what are the strongest signals. One very strong signal is location. If you live in a place and we have news next to that place, we're going to serve you more of that. We have to do all these things. Video experience is another one. If you, if you like a lot of video, we're going to serve you a little more video. We're not going to give you a full video site. We're going to give you the Washington Post site. But if you like video, we'll give you more video. If you don't like video, we'll give you less video. Here's an example from an advertising point of view. Here's an advertiser. And we were able to create branded content, very clearly labeled. It's very important to our brand that it's clear that it's from an advertiser. But it's specific to that, the kind of user group. We set content against that. So what happened? This is our theory. This is our approach. But does it actually work? You know, a lot of times people talk about their theories. And you say, well, yeah, but did it work in reality? We're very happy with our results. In the first half of the year, this is an old slide actually through today, the Post has added more unique visitors, more audience year over year than any news site and information site in the United States. More than BuzzFeed, Vice, Vox, you name it. Uh, so we've had more growth than anybody, including through October. We were named the most innovative media company in the world by Fast Company for 2015 for a lot of this, which helps us develop new partnerships. And importantly, looking at mobile, mobile's grown enormously, our audience has grown enormously, but desktop has grown also. If you really optimize each consumer experience, you don't have to trade mobile growth for desktop growth. We've actually had both, part of because we embrace new platforms. UVs and page view growth has been extraordinary. And because of our focus on mobile and because of our uh, willingness to embrace the platforms, a huge percentage of our growth is millennials. We get 44% of our smartphone audience is from millennials. We have to do this in order to be a sustaining brand to keep lasting. And probably the most important aspect is that it's not a case. Some people say we were just creating audience, but that's thin. That's one user. That's a UV. It's not worth anything. We're also creating uh, the opportunity for people to sample our product and then buy us. So, the, so our com score, unique visitor growth, our audience growth has been great. But our paid digital subscription growth has actually grown at a faster trend than our audience. So the theory that people would try us and they'd like us more and keep coming back to us is actually playing out in reality. We now have 59 million unique viewers in the United States, 19 million outside the United States. And our October numbers are going to be higher than this. Uh, they're not out. won't be out for another week, but they're going to be even better than this. So hopefully. The, um, the lessons from the Washington Post are ones that resonate with the group. And for a 138-year-old media company, we're very excited that we just had our best year ever. Thank you very much.